All right, have a seat and take your Bibles. Turn to Matthew chapter 7. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 7. Let's go ahead and read. Uh, we'll start in verse 21, and then we'll read through the end of the chapter. Our Lord, the incarnate word, says this to you and me this morning. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, but it did not fall, because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And when Jesus finished saying these things, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Amen. So it's been coming up on a year here since uh, the Marshall Fire. In fact, it'll be uh, 10 months tomorrow, um, December 31st, last year. Um, I was actually here. It was a Thursday. And I was working away and feeling the church shake with the 100 mile an hour winds that were going on. And and I got up and I just went to walk around and stretch for a little while. And I walked out in the foyer and I saw the beginnings of the fire about two miles away right over there. And the smoke was about five feet off the ground racing. And I just said to myself, there's no way this ends well. None. And I actually, you know, I don't, is this bad? But I went and pulled out a table from the back and set it up in the foyer. And work started working there so I could watch everything. And, and of course, you know, it just went from bad to worse. Um, Ended up getting into the car and driving around. I drove about half a mile up by the, the Catholic church there and stopped and watched that whole side of the side there burn. Several houses going down. I watched one on top of Marshall Ridge over there. It was just, it was really shocking. You know, and it's interesting. That was great destruction. And, and how many structures went down? A thousand something? Is that how many went down? Maybe not just houses, but other things too. And, and you know, I, I ride my bike around in this area a lot. And, and if, you go behind, if you go behind Costco, that neighborhood was completely gone. And there's just, I think, one house that's starting to come back up over there. Over here by the golf course, there's a neighborhood that was completely destroyed. I think there's three houses that are just in framing stage right now. Um, and I know maybe uh, below on McCaslin Boulevard, there's one or two other houses that are going up as well. It's really just devastating, devastating stuff and shocking. You know, and I, you know, I was getting texts from people all over the country saying, you okay? And, you know, I was texting back. I said, I'm about a mile from the flames. It's pretty crazy. I don't think it's going hit, to hit the church and things like that. But it was, it was intense. Well, how about this? How much worse would it have been if it wasn't just thousands of houses, but thousands of people? who died, who were destroyed, who were taken down. Thousands of people or a thousand people would have perished. Where would we be right now? What would be our attitude? What would it have been like when those fires hit at that time and as, as sort of raw and shocked and maybe hurting as we were as a community? How much worse would it be? How much more shocking? How much more traumatic would it have been had it been a thousand people? I'm sure many of you will read the news, um, and you saw the news out of Seoul, South Korea yesterday. Um, a Halloween parade uh, didn't end well, and 139 or 140 people, 149 maybe, were killed. Uh, they were crushed to death in a parade yesterday. I read stuff like that, and... It jolts me, right? Jolts you. And again, that's thousands of miles away, and so it probably feels some distance and stuff like that. But again, you don't have to read much in our papers to see what's going on. But even then, to have a 1,000 people die in the Marshall Fire, and here's the, the crazy thing is I guarantee you would have known some of them too, 
right? You would have known some of those people. It wouldn't just be this mass. It would be people that you knew close by. Well, this passage here, Jesus, I think if we can kind of, if we can kind of put this passage in the context of the martial fire, it might make it a little bit more real to us. It might make it a little bit more um, heartfelt. It might penetrate our soul and our mind a little bit more. Martial fire, houses. But what if it was houses and people? And Jesus here is using the picture of houses destroyed to point to the reality of people being destroyed, not houses. Not houses. Again, as we've gone through this, we, we understand that this text here, this ending of the Sermon on the Mount, really is maybe the most intense, sobering, um, I, I would hope, humbling text in the whole of Scripture. There's a lot of them. Um, but we sit there and we read the Psalms and, and we see these imprecatory Psalms or we read the accounts in the Old Testament of destruction and stuff like that. And that seems kind of removed from us, and it is. But these words here are coming out of the mouth of your Savior. These words here are coming out of the mouth of God to you, to me, today, right now. This isn't some historical event that happened two, three, four thousand years ago. It's not even something that happened in the early church. This is something that's happening right now. This is something that didn't happen in December 31st last year. This is now. And it needs to be understood as now. It really does. And I hope and pray that as we go through this text here this morning, that again, we're looking at this. And as Isaiah writes at the end of his book, where he says that God is high and he's up there, he's in a holy place. But to this one I will look, he was contrite and trembles at my word. And if there's ever a word to tremble at, it's these. It's these ones. So this morning, let's, let's look at this text here and let's draw out from here because only by building well on the anchored rock of Jesus will we endure to heaven. Therefore, we must do so. We must do so. So let's, let's first of all, let's look at the scene here. Let's, let's look at this picture that we're looking at and what's going on. Okay, so uh, how many people have been to Israel? Anybody? couple of you and stuff like that. So, so this is kind of how I picture it. You know, pic- Jesus is on the side of the Sea of Galilee. All right, he's on a hill. And, and probably I would guess, I, I could be wrong, but there's probably a view of the Sea of Galilee that he's looking over and a couple towns around there. But way off in the east, you see the, the eastern side towards Moab. And at least on that side, if I'm not mistaken, it's like desert over there. Just big red rock sandstone canyons coming down through there. And and so in other parts of Israel, it's that way as well, especially as you move further east, it's more dry. And so you have this, this scene, you have a valley, a valley perhaps in Israel, in that area, it's dry and it's hot, but it's also beautiful. If you like kind of the Arizona thing, this time of year, don't go down there in the summer. But, but if you like the Arizona scene, which I kind of do, that southwest deserty stuff, it really is kind of pretty. It really is kind of nice. And, and it is beautiful. There's these steep canyon walls, right, that maybe they trap heat. But then when the sun passes over, they get shady and maybe it's a little bit better. It's a dry stream bed right there. And again, it might be that Jesus is looking across the Sea of Galilee into these rugged canyons. And that's what he's talking about. He's talking about a scene like that. And so what might the scene be for you and me? Okay. Um, Again, if you've been to Arizona and you like it down there, maybe it's a little more, you know, cross the bridge, pretty easy to grab a hold of. But but around here, what what is it like for you and me? Maybe, Maybe it's a mountain stream surrounded by forest in the fall. Absolutely beautiful. Aspens are turning colors, all that stuff. If you're like me, you're watching the creek and there's trout rising and taking bugs. Maybe there's an elk or five out in the woods close by. It's really a a pleasant situation. It's really nice. Okay. One day, two men show up and each of them perches a plot of land next to the stream. Within a month or so, one man is sitting on his deck overlooking the stream enjoying a warm cup of coffee as he watches the aspen leaves change. Doesn't that sound delightful? 
Sounds really nice, doesn't it? I like that. Maybe he's got his rod out and he's just going to stand on his deck and, you know, fly fish out there. I won't say anything about him blasting an elk with his gun. But anyway, you know how it is. So, but then he looks over at his neighbor and all he sees is a big hole, big hole in the ground. That's it. Nothing else. The owner sticks his head out. He's covered with dirt, nasty. He's got calluses on his hands. He's tired. All these types of things. Yeah, and, and the man with the finished home looks at him and feels sorry for him. Wow, look at him. He's working so hard here, and, and I have this beautiful home all set to go. But maybe by Christmas, both houses are finished. Okay, that's you know, pretty quick anyway. But, but you know, they started in, say, July, and now, now you know, by, by Christmas, both houses are finished. They look the same. They're made out of the same materials, same layout. You know, they, they, they got online and bought the same architectural plan, right? Same layout, same benefits of location. Fishing, beauty, water right there, all that stuff. Everything they, they love. Both owners are out on the deck on a, on, a, on a somewhat warmish January morning. If you're me, that's like the low 40s. You know, the somewhat morning, warmest January morning while, while enjoying a cup of coffee. You know, holding up the cup. Morning! This type of stuff. But then March comes. March comes. And there's a little snowstorm. Okay. Now, I wasn't around here in 2003. But I know a lot of you were. Um, and there was a monster snowstorm in 2003 here. Now, you'll know that, again, my dad died in 2002 in an avalanche. And, and so one of the things that I do is I, I tend to, when, I, when I'm processing grief, is I just, I go all in. And so I was following avalanches for the next several years. Um, I gave money to the information center, all that type of stuff. And I just kind of followed it. And so when this huge storm hit in 2003, I was really, really interested. And it, it hit the front range. It was, it was an upslope condition. So it's coming out of the east and slamming into the mountains. And, and I want to say, how much snow fell here? Was it 30 some inches in this area? Okay. Well, up in the mountains, it was feet, feet. And if you go through Georgetown, you go past Georgetown, you're driving up and you look off to the left, there's a, there's a mountain there. And if you go up, there's a ridge, and then it drops off, and then a higher ridge. And the avalanches would hit. They'd start at the high ridge, and they kind of swall, swish around in that upper basin up there. Well, in 2003, an avalanche came down through that, went all the way down to the highway, and took trees and put them up on the other side of the Interstate 70. It was that bad. Okay. Massive snowstorm. Well, up here at Long's Peak, there's Chasm Lake, which many of you are familiar with. Um, there was a little hut built there. I want to say it was the early 1900s even. Stone hut, they just took the stones and built that type of stuff. Been up there for 100 years, 70, 80, 100 years. Well, if you're familiar with, uh, with uh, Long's Peak, there's, a, there's a, a, a formation above it called the chute. Is that right, Forrest? Is that what it is? Yeah. Anyway, there, there, there's a big chute up there. And an avalanche came down that thing, hit that house, and carried it half a mile down the mountain in multiple pieces, of course. It's a massive destruction, massive destruction. And, and so what we're seeing here is this March storm hits this place, and for whatever reason, these guys either, you know, yeah, may, there might have been an avalanche run close by, but there wasn't one there. But it was a 2003 storm, and it comes down, and it hits both houses. It hits both houses. The man who was in the hole in the fall his house survives. His house survives. The man who was sipping coffee in the fall, his house is gone. It's gone completely and totally. I, I, there's a new documentary about uh, the Nepal earthquake that occurred in 2015. Uh, 9,000 people were killed. It was a massive, I think, 7.8 magna, magnitude earthquake. And 20 people at Everest Base Camp died. Um, and then on another section of the country called the Langtang Valley, there was Langtang Village. And a rock slide slash avalanche came down the hill and destroyed the whole thing. Over 100 people were killed there. Just destroyed the whole thing. And you look at it and you could see bits and pieces of what used to be houses. 
but it was gone, gone. Well, that's, that's Jesus' picture here. That's his simile. A man is like. This is his lesson from nature. And again, the Israelites understood this picture. They, they knew what it was like to be in these valleys in Israel um, when the rains would come and the torrent would come down that thing and take everything away. Be encouraged to take some time, YouTube, floods in Israel, and just see what it looks like. Or you can do floods in Arizona because uh, those ones are pretty crazy. I watched one that occurred this last spring and... Um, there was a car being carried down a dry river bank, well, what used to be dry, and the people are in there holding on, wondering what's going to happen. And by God's grace, they made it. When you look at the rapids in the Colorado River, the reason there's rapids there is because there's these slot canyons where the storms will come down, and they'll just pick up water and rock and throw it into the river. Huge boulders. And that's what causes the rapids in the Colorado River. So, so you get the picture, okay, Two houses, one, the man takes the time to dig down deep, put it on the foundation. The storm comes, he survives. The other guy, no. Just puts it up, storm comes, gone. That's Jesus' picture, fairly straightforward. But let's comprehend the reality now. What is Jesus specifically talking about? He's not talking about houses. He's talking about people, talking about men. He's talking about two different men. And, and what do we know by looking at this, this parable, this simile, this story? What can we learn about these two people? All right. Number one, they have a lot in common. A whole lot in common. They both listen to Jesus' words. They both hear him. They're both, quote, in church, as it were, under the teaching of the words of Jesus, under the teaching of the Bible. Both of them want to build up their lives. They want to have a good life. They want to be in a beautiful place that has good supplies of stuff. You know, maybe, uh, again, you look at these wadis uh, in the desert. That's where some little fields where you can actually grow something. That, that's it. You know, like an oasis in the middle of the desert. So they, they want some benefit. They like the beauty. They like the location. It feels good. And I mean, for me, again, sitting on a deck with a cup of coffee in a warmest January day is delightful. It really is. It's wonderful. They, so they both want good things. Nothing wrong with wanting good things. But one of them is wise. The other one is a fool. That's a contrast. So when disaster strikes, which it will, that's the implication that Jesus is saying here, and again, if you live anywhere, you know that disaster strikes, be it a martial fire, be it an avalanche, a flood, whatever it might be, a Halloween parade. Disaster strikes, it will, and the wise man endures, but the fool is destroyed. So again, same desires, a nice, comfortable, happy life. Now, isn't that what you want? That's what I want, a nice, comfortable, happy life. Not in the sense of just frivolousness, but a, a depth of, of joy, a depth of peace, a depth of stability. Again, same location. They're in the church listening to Jesus' words. They're on, the, they're on the hill listening to him. The same look. They look the same even. Dress the same, talk the same. And they have a lot of things in common. They can be found, again, in the same place. They're in the church as members. They sing and they pray together. They listen to the same sermon. They give their monies. They serve in a given capacity in the church. They look like each other. In other words, what Jesus is saying here is that as you're looking around the church right here, you don't know. You just don't know. There may be people within this church right here who look the same, act the same, do the same stuff. But one of them's a fool, the other one's wise. One of them's a fool, the other one's wise. Again, the same desires. They want forgiveness. They want peace. I mean, th th there is this reality, right, that we, we understand that we do things wrong. 
okay? And we hurt people. And we do that all the time. I've had many an unbeliever come up to me and apologize to me for something that they did to me. And of course, I've done the same, right? And we all have this, this realization that there's some level of guilt in us. And what can I do? What can I do to, to alleviate that guilt? What can I do? I, I want that gone. Again, I want peace. I, I want to have a, 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 a generally, e- not, not easy per se, but just a nice life. Not, not marked by controversy or upheaval, in the, upheaval but, but just nice. And again, I would guess that the vast majority of the people in the world want that. They want peace. And a lot of them come to church looking for it. They do. Maybe not so much anymore. Comfort and consolation. Everything's going to be okay. Your, your life isn't just meaningless nonsense. Your life has a purpose. There's guidance and counsel. Need some advice. How do I handle this situation? What do I do? Maybe, maybe it's a reputation. Now, I don't think that's an issue so much anymore, but I remember... When I first started going to church as a 17-year-old, and I I was going to this church in Fort Collins, and someone said to me, oh, that church. That's the church that everybody who's anybody goes to. And maybe, and I didn't know what to think of that, but I don't think that's necessarily an issue anymore in our society. You know, you don't go to church if you're wanting to look good in the community, right? Not something that you're necessarily wanting to do. You want to go to heaven, right? Right? You want to believe that this life is more important, there's something beyond it, that again, it's not just mean, meaningless, you want to go there. And again, that's us. That's people in the church. And that's what Jesus is saying here. He's saying, look, here's these people that have so much in common. They really do. But then there's one huge difference that makes all the difference in the world. One difference that determines that this one person's wise and the other one's a fool. Which one is it? The wise man listens to Jesus. The fool listens to Jesus. The wise man does what Jesus says. The fool doesn't. The fool doesn't. Both of them want what Jesus has. One of them is coming on Jesus' terms. The other one is coming on their own terms. In, in my evangelistic outreaches and gospel opportunity, I've said to people, look, all the stuff you're looking for, love, joy, peace, forgiveness, help, counsel, heaven, you know, all of that stuff, Jesus has all of it. Jesus has all of it. And I've said to people, Jesus has everything you Need not only everything you need in the truest sense, everything you would ever want, he has it all and he wants to give it to you. He wants you to experience the blessedness of being known by him and following him. Didn't he say it in John 15? These things I have spoken to you so that what my joy might be in you and your joy would be complete. Friends, Jesus wants that for you. He wants it for me. He wants it for people. And so there's nothing wrong with telling people, look, Jesus has everything you would ever desire. And he does. But the hard part is you you come on his terms. You don't come on your terms. You don't get to come in there and just build this quick little house and experience all the benefits. No. There's more to it. A lot more to it. The fool doesn't listen to God's word. And and Jesus here speaks, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, verse 23, I never knew you, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. It's not about what you do. It's not about how you look. It's rather who knows you. Jesus says this in Luke 6, 46, the parallel passage. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? And then, of course, most illuminating is James 1, 22 through 25. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. 
For anyone who is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in the mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty, and perseveres, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. Okay, so, so we have this picture here, and, and we're looking at these two people, and they look the same, they live in the same place, they do all the same stuff. But, but what do we know that's different? What do we know? All right. So a comparing and contrasting between someone who is willing to do the word of God and someone who isn't. Number one, the fool wants the blessings of God right now. He's impatient. Builds his house on the sand quickly. I, I, I see the good things that Jesus has to offer, and I want them. I want them, and I want them now. I want the sweet parts. I, I, want, the, I want the things that make me feel good. And, and maybe, you've, maybe you've had people like this when you've shared the gospel, or maybe it's a, someone who used to, used to know Jesus or claim to know Jesus, and, they, and they've said to me, yeah, I tried the Christian thing. It didn't work for me. Well, what is that? Is they came to it wanting simply the blessings. They want the good stuff without the meat. They want the sweet parts. I'll never forget this. Again, avalanche stuff going through my head. Again, dad was killed in March of 2002. And in June, once the snow all went away, I and several people that were on the trip <clears throat> that were with dad when the avalanche occurred, I wasn't with him, but a lot, of, a lot of people were, and we all went back to the site of it, and it was potent. You know, we found his sunglasses, his bandana, you know, ski poles, things like that. It was really really hard. <clears throat> okay. But part of my goal in going back was to spend some time alone in prayer just to worship God. Okay. Because that's, you know, naked. I came from my mother's womb, naked. I shall depart. The Lord gives the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so I wanted to go and just find where he died. Not there specifically. He was killed by a tree. So I was up above and just looking down and I, I took a Bible with me and I'm sitting up there and I'm, I'm reading I don't even remember what I was reading, but I was reading and crying and just praising and thanking God for my dad and, and just trying to bring my thoughts captive is, is what I was doing. And this other person who was on the trip looked at me <clears throat> and I could tell they were, should I go sit next to him? Should I not? You know, all this stuff. And they were kind of like, you know, I need to go help Eric, right? He's hurting. Well, I was, amen. You know, and, and so this person, maybe out of the good intentions of their heart, wanted to come up to me and comfort me. So they came and sat down. And put their arm around me, cried with me, like, what are you reading, Eric? And I don't, as I said, I don't even remember what, what I was reading. <laughs> but it, it had a lot of comfort in it, but there was also some harder stuff, some judgment stuff in it, some, some you know, get ready stuff, some God is holy stuff. And I started to read it, and this person, again, <laughs> 20 years later now, this person had the audacity to say, you shouldn't read that. Just read the good stuff, Eric. Don't focus on this other stuff. And, and I was so taken aback. And I, and I mean, I'm glad that the Holy Spirit was on me because I didn't even think to get angry. But, you know, there's a part of me just wants to say, who do, who do you think you are coming to me and telling me how I should mourn or not mourn? Praise God I didn't say that. But that, that's the way we are, isn't it? Yeah, yeah read the comforting stuff. Read the sweet stuff, but stay away from that judgment stuff. Stay away from that. God is holy. Stay away from that total depravity stuff. So, so these two people, one of them loves doctrine, loves all of it, okay? The fool might love doctrine too, but only parts of it. And, and here's the challenge, right? Should we be people who are focused on the love of God? Yeah. Love of God is delightful. It's wonderful. But the love of God isn't meaningful unless we're looking at it in light of his justice and his wrath. His grace, his kindness is delightful. His mercy is wonderful. 
but they're only wonderful in light of what we deserve, of what we have coming to us or should have coming to us. Let's talk about heaven, the foolish person says. Let's read all of that. Let's talk about love. Let's talk about sweet fellowship. Let's enjoy each other. Let's go to the potlucks. Let's do this type of stuff. Let's even serve together. But don't, let's not talk about wrath. Let's not talk about justice. Let's not talk about sin and wickedness. The, the, the wise person who is building their life on the rock of Christ Jesus wants to know what it means to suffer well for the glory of God. Wants to ask the question, I know difficulty is coming. I know sooner or later a storm, an avalanche, a sickness, a fire, a death. Something is going to come. And it's going to try to take me down. How do I deal with that? How do I deal with that? They, they, they look at this passage in Matthew chapter 5, right after the Beatitudes, where Jesus says this. <clears throat> Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of not evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The wise man looks at that. And I don't want that to happen, but I realize it's going to happen. And therefore, what? Therefore, what? The foolish man doesn't want to hear about that. The foolish man doesn't want to have to deal with hard people. Doesn't want to worry about sharing the gospel with people in the sense that, look, if they reject it, I might be rejected. Because they're not thinking about judgment and wrath and heaven and hell. They're thinking about what makes my life good. I'm okay, you're okay. Just, just be a decent, somewhat moral person. The foolish person, again, agrees that he's not perfect, has some issues, might even have some sin. But the doctrine of total depravity offends him. When he, when he comes to passages like Genesis 6, 5, where the Lord looks down from heaven upon the sons of men and he sees that the intents and desires of their heart are only evil continually and God is sad. He's sorrowful that he made man. And then you get to chapter 8 and 9 and he destroys man. I think I've told you I, I write forgot questions. My, my question this last week had to do with you know, how do we engage or how do we wrestle with the concept that people can only be saved if they hear the gospel? Well, we know that there's literally millions, if not billions of people who have lived and are living who won't hear it. And this person was, I think they were edgy about it. I, how do you read attitudes out of emails? I don't know. But anyway, they were edgy about it. And, and, and I, I, I brought before the person this statement. I said, look, I know this is tough stuff, but let me ask you. Before you ever heard the gospel, were you so ignorant or innocent that God would be unjust in sending you to hell? This is the question I asked. And then I said, you know what? Here's the thing. Who was I before I was saved? And I said, kindly, I was a debauched blasphemer. That's who I was. Okay. Paul, how does he refer to himself? Before salvation, blasphemer, violent aggressor, persecutor. That's how he refers to himself. And then at the end of his life, what does he say? I am, this, I am the chief of sinners. The chief. And it's not I was, I am. And then I asked, are, are you thankful for the person who shared the gospel with you, who pointed you to Jesus? I said, I sure am. I sure am. Now, now why does God do that for some and not for others? his business. Ephesians 1. His purpose is according to his glory. His ways are higher than yours. Higher than mine. That's Isaiah 55. And then you come to Isaiah 66, which we just referenced a few moments ago. God is high in a lofty place, but to this one I will look. He who is contrite of heart and trembles at my word. 
That's our response, friends. God will not do anything unjust. He won't do that. The only thing that he does that's unjust is that he takes the justice of Jesus and gives it to us. That's it. So, so friends, that's the tough stuff. No one wants to hear about that. The, 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 the fool doesn't want to deal with those hard questions. And I'm not saying there's an easy answer to them. But I am saying that in his word, God has given us necessary information so that we can follow him. Follow him faithfully. Not 100% knowingly, but faithfully. The, the fool hates the idea that we're children of wrath. Hates it. And what does this say? Doesn't truly want to know God. That's it. Wants the benefits. Wants to live in God's house, experience his stuff, but doesn't want him. Doesn't want him. So, so the question then becomes, so which one are you? Again, Jesus makes this very clear. Look, this is the church. This is people sitting under the preaching and teaching of God's word, giving money, singing, praying, serving, whole nine yards. So which one are you? Well, there, there, there's, there's a couple of ways you can do this. I would encourage you to take some time. Um, we're wrapping up the Sermon on the Mount next week probably, but just take some time and go back through it. Go back through it. And, and just start asking yourself some questions. Look at the Beatitudes. Can, can you say to yourself, I am poor in spirit? Yeah, and you understand, as we looked at, and maybe you've heard this before, what does it mean to be poor in spirit? It means that you understand that you have nothing of value to offer God at all. Nothing. Naked in my hand, I cling. Nothing in my hand I bring. How's it go? Rock of ages, I'm a butcher. It. But foul, I to the fountain fly, wash me, Savior, or I die. In fact, we, we can say this with confidence, that only the person who understands what it means to be poor in spirit is born again. Because that's something that God has to give to us. A person who's truly mourning over their sin, not just because it damages them, not just because it might hurt a family member, but it's offense against the holy God. When they, when they read Psalm 51 and, and, and David after breaking every single one of the Ten Commandments, and royally so, says, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. They understand that every sin that they've committed is first and foremost an offense against the holy God. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Not, not our own righteousness, because that'll never satisfy, but the righteousness of Jesus. We could go on. You know, look at the motivations that were dealt with in chapters 5 and 6. Look at all these things that he's saying here about the word. Just read through it. Take a look. Ask yourself, is this me? Now, are we perfect in this? Not in any way, shape, or form. By the way, without going into details, um, studying these passages over the past two to three weeks, I've been in a low spot the whole time. Okay? I would, I would argue that, that if you're taking this word seriously, you can't look at these texts and not go, oh my goodness. A am I this? Am I this? Now, you keep rehearsing the gospel, you keep on going back. So, so work through the Sermon on the Mount. Ask yourself, is this me? Am I growing in my understanding of these things? Are the motivations that Jesus is dealing with, are, are these my motivations? Am I looking at these passages that say, not many are going to say, Lord, Lord, and they're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Am I taking some time and asking myself, is that me? And remember what, what I said last week, the Puritan that said, for every look at yourself, take 10 looks at Jesus, right? And, and that's one of the ways that you can know that, that, that you can have some confidence that you're not the one who's going to say, Lord, Lord, or the one who's building their house on the sand, is that you're focused on Jesus. You're focused on the gospel. You're focused on who he is and what he's done. These types of things. How do you accept some of the hard teachings of the word? What do you do with those? Maybe this is a, a simple one, but what do you do with Philippians 4.13? Do 
Do you, do you put that on your wristband as you're getting ready to play the football game? Do you, do you say, I'm, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me as I get ready to climb Long's Peak or something like that? Okay. The only way you're going to climb Long's Peak is if God allows you to, right? It's his strength. But what is Philippians 4.13 about? I've learned to be content in whatever circumstance I'm in. I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, suffering wants and stuff like that. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Friends, when you find yourself in the valley, you find yourself someone hurting and you're hurting, you're in a real bad situation. That's when Philippians 4.13 is to be applied. That's when, okay, I don't know what to do with this. This is really hard. This stinks. But I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Paul in 2 Corinthians, you know the passage, he says he has this thorn in his flesh and he asked God to take it away and God said, no, not going to do it. What do you do when God says no to you? What do you do? How do you respond? Of course, we know God goes on, Christ says, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. Then listen to Paul's words here. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me for the sake of Christ. Then what? I am content with weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, calamities. Happy with those things. Content with those things. I'm looking at passages like Luke 9.23, where Jesus says, if anyone would be my disciple, he must deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. For what? For whoever would wish to save his life will lose it. But whoever wishes to, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Am I, again, I'm not, saying, I'm not saying that it's easy. I'm not saying it doesn't take a lifetime of thought. And, and by no means am I saying in any way, shape, or form that we have to be perfect at this because we just can't do it. In fact, if we, if we truly understand who we are in Christ and we say, Lord, do I truly hunger and thirst for righteousness, I recognize that it's not my righteousness that I'm hungering for. It's Jesus' righteousness. And as Paul says in Philippians 3, I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own, but the righteousness that comes through faith, the righteousness of Christ that comes through faith. That's the righteousness that we're hungering and thirsting for. Nothing of ourselves, nothing of ourselves. So, brothers and sisters, do you comprehend the reality? Do you comprehend the reality? Thirdly, this morning, do you understand the consequence? Do you understand the consequence? The wise man survives and endures. The fool is destroyed. Now, is that just simply, you know, the storm comes in this life and the wise man makes it and the fool gets wiped out? No, the whole thing here, this whole implication is about the final judgment. It is. Okay. Now, we'll, we'll come back and talk about trials of this life. But again, go to Revelation 20 and look at that great throne judgment. And, and either you're depending on Christ's righteousness and therefore your name is written in God's book of life, or you're depending on your own righteousness, in which case, okay, God will put you out there and you and him will examine your righteousness and be found wanting. And what is the result? The wise man who is depending upon the justification and righteousness of Christ goes to heaven for all eternity. The fool who is not depending on the righteousness of Christ, simply wanting the benefits without the gospel, that person, what? Lake of fire for all eternity. That's why Jesus says, great, great is the fall of this person. Great. So again, which one are you? Which one are you? Again, this passage in its truest sense is pointing to final judgment. It really is. But we also understand that trials and storms are present in our life today. They're there. Okay. And we, we know that God tells us in his word that we're to rejoice in these things. We're to let them do their purifying, sanctifying work in our life. 
So, so let me just ask you, what are trials and storms when they come upon you? What are they doing to you? What are they doing to you? What are they revealing? Are they revealing bitterness and anger? Are they revealing, God, how could you do this to me? Now look, friends, we've all been there, okay? I'm not going to sit here and say for a minute I've not said those things. But, but, am, but are you and am I at the point to realizing, even in the midst of the struggle, if I don't understand this and it hurts and I don't understand it, am I, am I right in raising my fist to God and say, how dare you do this to me? No. I'm not. If I'm in Christ, if I'm born again, I have everything already. God has poured out everything for me in Christ. And so I take it from him in the grace and strength of him when a storm and trial comes upon me, what's it revealing about me? And over the years, the decades or years that you followed Jesus, what have storms and trials done to you? Are, are they revealing a house built on the rock that is learning to love Christ through everything, learning to hold on to him, and, and, and is crazy and is nut job as it sounds, you look back on the major tragedies of your life and you say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. I don't know if this guy's a believer or not, but I <laughs> watched this, watch this show. He was a bodybuilder and he was 21 years old and was in a car accident, paralyzed from the I think, chest down. Okay. And a short thing. And so he's a bodybuilder now, just massive, big muscles and stuff like that. The very last thing he said as they shut down, he said, and I don't know if he's a believer or not, he said, but, you know, my first 21 years of my life were great. He said, these last 21 have been better. Better. That sounds like something a believer would say. Okay, I don't know. But that's the thing, friends. Storms and trials, what are they revealing about you? As much as we look forward to heaven and being with Jesus, Amen. Are you at the same time aware of and embracing the reality that Jesus spoke more about hell and judgment than he did about heaven? Are you living in light of Hebrews 9.27? It's appointed for man to die once and after that comes judgment. Until a person is ready to die, they're not really alive. Until a person is ready to see their maker and rest in Jesus' righteousness and confidence before him, you're not really alive. You're just not. I want to be alive. I want to live fully. What does that mean? That I'm ready to meet God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's what it means. You know, we all love John 3.16, don't we? You know, the foolish man says, I know John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him, will have eternal life. Is that what it says? Mm -hmm. I just left out one part. Did you catch it? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Don't skip over that perish part. Don't let that go. Think about what you're not going to be perishing. What does that mean? Think about what Jesus did for you. Live in light of that. Rest in the grace of Jesus, yes, but then rejoice in the rescue. Rest in the grace. Rejoice in the rescue. Might you do this? Take some time. Maybe in the next few days, there's still a lot of them around. Take a look at some of those houses that were destroyed in the fire. Okay? Even their foundations are gone. They've had to jackhammer those things out and start over. Okay? Complete destruction. Complete. And then ask yourself, is this me? I would trust that the first thing that comes into your mind is you say, no, I'm depending on Jesus Christ and his work and his life, and I am building the foundation on him and he is the rock what, that will never be moved. Never. 
And he makes a promise to us here. There, 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 yes, there's warning here, but there's also a promise. If you build on me, you will never be moved. You will stand strong through everything. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood, righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Build well, friends. Build well. Because only by building well on the anchored rock of Jesus will we endure to heaven. We must do so. Build well. And it starts with believing in him for forgiveness of sins and eternal life. And then building from there. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, thank you again for your word, the challenge therein. The warning.